Hello, I'm Jennifer Carlson. I am Mehdi Kiani. And we are presenting a review on a paper about transcranial magnetic stimulation and the human brain for an Introduction to Neuroscience course at Georgia Tech. This paper was published in Nature in July 2000 by Mark Hallett. In 1985, Baker and colleagues developed a new method of brain stimulation that improved upon the conventional method of transcranial electrical stimulation, or TES, developed by Merton and Morton in 1980. TES uses brief high voltage electric shock to activate the motor cortex. The problem with this method is that the shocks activated the pain fibers in the scalp. The new method, transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, uses external magnetic stimulation to stimulate both nerves and brain in a way that causes little or no pain. In TMS, uh, a coil of wire, as shown in the figure below, which called magnetic wire is used above the scalp. This wire by, by applying a current in this wire, the, electric, the magnetic field is generated, which, is, which can change in the time. The time variant magnetic field will reduce an electric field based on the Maxwell law, which has been shown in this slide. The electric field can induce a current which is parallel to the coil wire that it can be seen in this figure as the current flow. The current flow in the tissue can produce stimulation in the tissue or human brain. There are two TMS devices currently used. Single pulse delivers only one pulse, which is very safe for its subjects. RTMS is repetitive TMS and delivers high frequency pulses from 1 to 30 Hz, which has a greater effect but a higher potential of seizures. The figure in the slide shows a TMS device positioned over the scalp. The applications of TMS have been discussed in these slides TMS may be useful for therapy. Also, it can be used as a tool to measure the central motor conduction time, which will be discussed further in the, in the next slides. It can be used also as a research tool to study motor function, vision, and language. Some examples include TMS of motor cortex, which can produce, produce a muzzle twitch, or TMS of occipital cortex, which can produce visual phosphines or scotomas, that visual phosphine is for strong TMS and scotomas are for low intensity TMS. As another example, it has been shown that TMS of area V5 can selectively interfere with the perception of motion of a stimulus visual impairing its rec recognition, which supports the hypothesis that V5 is the motion perception region of the brain. Before TMS was developed, PET, or positron admission tomography, and fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging, were used to attempt to connect cortical networks with cognitive functions. The problem with these is that they had small time resolution, and most importantly, they couldn't prove that an area was essential for a particular function. TMS, in contrast, is a simpler solution because of its ability to disrupt activity in focal areas, which can link the area to the cognitive function. One example for the use of TMS shown in this paper is a guide in epilepsy patients to determine their dominant side in language processing prior to a temporal lobectomy. The standard test is a WADA test that uses an injection to find out the side on which speech arrest is produced. RTMS provides a simpler solution by applying pulses with rates of 8 to 25 hertz for 10 seconds, which produces lateralized speech arrest when the coil is positioned over the dominant side which for most people is the left inferior frontal region. As it was mentioned before, TMS can be used to measure the central motor pathways conduction time. In a study which was done on a normal subject and a patient, the conduction time was measured using TMS. The results have been shown in, the slide, in this slide. Three different areas were stimulated when the EMG signal from ADM muzzle was recorded. As shown in this figure, the stimulation of, ner of nerves at rest and C7 level of spinal cord resulted in the same response in both pa patient and normal subject. But when TMS was used to stimulate the hand area of cortex, the latency in the response for patient was observed. This is useful because slowing of conduction is seen in de degenerative diseases. TMS can be used as a tool to elucidate brain plasticity. The figure shown in this slide is the TMS mapping of left and right biceps from a 7-year-old subject 
11 months after a, a left limb amputation. Here, the map of the left biceps is over the right hemisphere, and the map of right biceps is over the left hemisphere. It can be seen that the muscles pro proximal to amputation had expanded into the area of, uh, of amputated area. This is an example of using TMS to show plasticity. The following are examples of therapeutic uses of TMS. Studies have found that multiple TMS single pulses result in no lasting effect, but RTMS produces effects that remain after the stimulation period. RTMS can be done at low and high frequencies. For high frequencies, more than 5 Hz, RTMS can potentially enhance motor excitability. For low frequencies, less than 1 Hz, RTMS can potentially depress motor excitability. Therefore, the reaction time can be sped up by high-frequency RTMS as a probable treatment for Parkinson diseases. On the other hand, slow RTMS is a candidate for dystonia in which we need to increase the inhibition. Also, RTMS can be used for treatment of mood disorders. For example, the depression can be improved by high-frequency RTMS. This has been our review on Mark Hallett's paper, TMS and the Human Brain. Thanks for listening.